games you deserve. Welcome to Games You Deserve, brought to you by Special Reserve Games. This week, we ask the dog fathers about their most prized collectibles. We also talk to Josh and Doug from Limited Run Games, and you'll hear part three of Fire Flower, my ongoing series on the history of Nintendo. a question of our OGs on the Discord server, uh, what their kind of most prized possession in their collection was. And I'll I'll give my example before we even read some of these, because I keep looking over here. And, and I, I even told the guys exactly what mine was. I happen to have been able to get my hands on this uh, Switch kiosk cartridge. And it's, it's, we only know of about 30 of them that have made it into the wild. They're not supposed to get out into the wild. They are typically a switch kiosk when you go to, say, GameStop, right, or Best Buy or whatever. And it's got the little screen and the, the switch that's attached. You can't take the switch off of the kiosk, right? It's all kind of a, in there. It's got special software running. And sometimes there's a demo or, or a handful of demos on there. Typically, if they want to update those, those things get updated over Wi-Fi. They get connected to whatever Wi-Fi is in, in the store, and then you know it just sends the update to it. Boom, does its thing. But there are some circumstances where a switch uh, has a kiosk that doesn't have a way to do that. They're not, they don't have Wi-Fi wherever they're at. And so you would be sent these little uh, switch cartridges. It's the same shell of a switch cartridge as, as a game. It's got a chip and a board in there. And with a switch that has the right firmware, that has the demo firmware, you're able to insert the cartridge and it updates the, the firmware that's on there to have the new demo, whatever that new demo might be. And uh, these unfortunately don't run in a standard switch. You have to have that firmware. So I have one of these. I was able to Get it from a seller that no longer exists on eBay. Don't know who they were. Uh oh. <laughs> I know. I don't know who they were, so I can't really out them for anything. But it, yeah, it's it's this cool thing that I was able to pick up. And uh, if you there's there's a sticker on top of the sticker. Uh oh. Uh-oh. What? Uh oh. You set off an alarm, Eric. That's the uh, <laughs> illegal software alarm. Yeah. Uh, they're coming for me. They're they're outside my house now. Um, Eric, Eric, come out. We we want your switch cartridge. That you, nobody understands what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it's cool. Yeah, when you when you peel the the front sticker off, which has some identifying marks on it, the one that's behind it. Now, I didn't do this to mine, but I've seen a picture of this. Um, the one that's behind it, instead of having the red label across the top that says Nintendo, it's in blue. So Ooh. their internal stuff is done a little differently than what the customer gets, and that's another way they can identify it. Do you know which games are on this? Like what? No, demo games I are don't on there? know exactly which demo games are okay. on it. We at the time this was made available, we had found out of three or four different versions of it, and uh, like I said, there's only about thirty of these that made it out into the wild. Clearly, whoever got a hold of these, you know, probably shouldn't have been selling them. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I was able to. I was able to snag one, and I know a few other people that were able to snag some of them. Yeah, Very which rare. is really cool. Cool. So uh, now, now, like I said, I asked this question of some of the folks in the uh, the Dog Fathers here on our Discord, and we had some really interesting answers. I mean, you had some some typical stuff where where people just had this one thing where they they just really were attached to it. Like Locke, he said, Hyrule Warriors for the Wii U. It had some personal significance uh, to that, but he didn't didn't really share what that was. Um, Coco said Shadow the Hedgehog on the 
Xbox and GameCube. Dan, I'm sure you're familiar with who Shadow the Hedgehog is. Yeah, I know who he is, but I never played yeah. that game. Um, That's interesting. He's Canadian. He's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Got a big maple leaf on his forehead. Um, yeah, that's X, right. XH John said King DDD Amiibo said there was a story behind it, but again, didn't share. But then we got something uh, where, where they kind of said why. Mr. Giraffe said the Sigil Beast Box from Limited Run. Now, Smitty probably knows a little bit about the connection to this. Sigil was uh, a, a release basically on, on of Doom, updated Doom wads. Uh, by the man himself, John Romero. Yes, yes. <laughs> so now, now that obviously has a big, you know, old school connection. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen the artwork for this, but it's incredible. It's done up in the nice demon style with all the the cool. Yeah, you know, I think art. Romero Romero went to the LRG offices in North Carolina. I think to like personally autograph some of the. Uh, oh yeah, some some yeah. versions or whatever, right? And guess what? It, Rem- John still has his beautiful hair. Oh yeah! If, you, if you've ever seen great hair, go look at John Romero. He's uh, he was the guy who established cool hair in the gaming industry. <laughs> that's that's true. That's true. Um, speaking of cool hair, Smangarang. I don't know if he's got cool hair or not. I'm just using that. Um, Smangarang <laughs> said that his his uh, complete inbox copy, his childhood copy of Earthbound is his thing, which is cool. I mean, if you got something from your your childhood, especially like that, where it's kind of an iconic game and you still have it. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And not only that, but to have the box, uh, like none of us ever kept those boxes for the Super Nintendo games or any of those. You know, the cardboard got torn and beat up and you just threw it out. You kept it. You kept it in the, the only ones, of course, Genesis games had a a more sturdy um, cartridge box or whatever. But yeah, to have that fully intact, uh, that that shows that he loves it. And Earthbound was actually a larger box than normal. It wasn't a standard size box. So maybe that's why he kept it, right? Maybe he liked that idea of it being a different box. I thought that was cool. Yeah, that's very cool. This, This next next one was I, I thought was really neat uh guy man stuff this is named guy man stuff said he his prize possession is his starcraft 64 cartridge but it's not just that it's signed it's signed by like oh i saw that one yeah six different uh devs from the team so you got yeah. mike morhaime frank pierce alan adam uh chris metzen samwise didier i'm probably butchering some of those names but he said that you know it's his favorite because he got to meet the team, got to know some of them, and even became friends with several of the Blizzard employees, which is mm-hmm. really cool. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, imagine the personal experience in that circumstance. So, mm, just like meeting movie stars. Exactly. Well, I mean, what's the difference nowadays? Nothing, right? No, I mean, you, they create they created a great piece of work, a great piece of entertainment that you love. Let me let me lay out a couple more here. Uh, Kingsley Cake, uh, good old Kingsley Cake, said uh, his favorite was his Live Dex Omega Ruby Pokemon game. And the reason was is that he took the time to catch every single Pokemon using only standard Pokeballs. That might as well be a That's that might as well be a foreign language to me. I'm not a Pokemon person. Yeah, I didn't so. do that either. No, I'm, uh, I'm not either. But I understand that it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of work put into that. That's like saving. It's like getting a perfect game in bowling or baseball or something like that, where you you want to remember what you accomplished with that. So I, I I get that. Like it's I don't think it's a particularly uh, uh, rare game or anything, but the fact that he went ahead and did that. <laughs> oh yeah, I totally uh, that's appreciate that idea remember. behind that. No, I, I just make the joke because I'm just not a person into Pokemon. Yeah, my kids love Pokemon. My kids are re- right into it. And they love it, and um, it, to me, I, I just miss that whole thing. Too old for me. This next one was from Ninja Guy X. Ninja Guy X said that his favorite piece in this, the one that's near and dear, is a vinyl. It's a vinyl of. Yasunori and Millennial Fair. And it was the one that he wanted the most at the time when he was first getting into this stuff. And it was impossible to find. Now, it, that, I mean, that's basically like his white whale at the time, right? He he was hunting for this thing and, and trying to get this copy. And he, I know from seeing a bunch of Ninja Guy X's vinyl collection, all this gaming audio vinyl that he's collected. He's He's got this incredibly cool collection of gaming vinyl that he's lined mm-hmm. up, you know, and, and just yeah. soundtracks and gaming vinyl for all kinds of games. 
and and nothing it's a great eclectic mix of of all of these so i thought you guys would appreciate that one dr awesome said the uh, bloodborne ce uh, he said he was going through a really tough time in life, essentially, and that game really helped him get through it. And that made me think, you know, the emotional connection that certain games can have. Just spend, oh, yeah. You know, it, it hits a person. We saw that with Grease, right? Oh, dude, I felt it. I felt it with Grease. Such an emotional game. And, and you're, you're, when you connect with something like that and you're playing with something like that, it, it the right game at the right time can Especially truly when it elicit catches emotion. You, when it catches you by surprise, too. Like, yeah. if you know this is a horror game and, you know, or this is, a, you know, like you kind of, you know, are expecting, like that you have expectations of a game. But when a game actually surprises you and then boop, boop, takes you a little into emotional town, you know, real quick, you know, good, bad, sad, whatever, just, it's, you know, plays on your emotions. I yeah. mean, that, that to me is, is one of the best things about that. So I can completely understand why they chose that game. Yeah. If that helped them get through that, imagine how you would feel, you know, it, it well, an and amazing you can thing. also have a different emotional experience each time as well. You know, oh, you yeah. can, you, I mean, that's a kind of a cool thing. It's different, kind of a similar with music, but not, you know, you can kind of experience it. But anyway, these are great answers from these there's a couple I mean, more here that i'll share um i just thought it was all going to be joust you know but <laughs> <laughs> original joust arcade yeah, cabinet yeah, that smitty the the smitty's standing next to <laughs> uh so danger 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 said uh he, he kind of brought it back to srg and said that his copy of downwell because for them uh, they, as a as a as a, a person who loves the simplicity in the design, the art style, the control schema, they they saw a beauty in that, and I mm -hmm. appreciated that. I thought that was cool. And then uh, the last one that I have here was from Panda FYI because uh, they they have a signed copy of a game also. So another autograph one from uh, a game called Caro Blaster. And the reason that's important is that uh, when they released that game, they only had 25 copies signed and they were randomly sent to the people that were purchased. So he lucked oh, out man. and happened to get one of those randomly signed ones. Imagine, imagine getting, opening that up and getting that in the mail and you just see that signature. This was signed by Daisuke Amaya and Kyoko Kawanaka. And I think translated that is Smith. Right. Probably, probably. It's probably that common. <laughs> Jeff's yeah. Yeah. But that, that, if you think back about all the different reasons, there was a lot of things in here about various personal significance, right? Mm -hmm. My example was more on the, the rareness and the value. And we had some people with some of that, but we also had a lot of people just connecting their personal experiences to these. And that just tells you a lot about why why people are valuing something, right? It's not, oh, this is expensive, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's cool. That's what I, that's what I always say. What's that worth? And then I say, well, the only answer is what it, what it's worth is it's what somebody will pay for it. That's right. And that's it. That's that's what it's worth. Yeah, exactly. It's not about the money. It's about the it's about the rarity. I mean, it's it's something to be said. I ha I own this thing that's very rare, and no, not very many other people own that. There is something to be said for that, but I don't think it's about selling that exactly. rare thing to make money. It's just about owning yeah. it and having that as part of your yeah. collection. But yeah, lots of personal connections. Lots of people who are like connecting to games through their experiences. Lots of people who are connecting to games through the people who created them, like getting the autographs of the developers and that kind of stuff. So those are some great uh, stories from uh, from the Dog Fathers. How can people join the Dog Fathers? Tell us, Eric. How can they join the Dog Fathers? Well, they send me a check with lots of zero. No, that's no, a, no. that's wrong. That's wrong. This is, this is wrong. Uh, oh, us send us. A, no, no, it's nah, not that at all. No money. It's not that at all. Um, if you are are a member of the Discord and you want to be a Dog Father, then all you need to do is use your Discord Nitro Boost to boost the server. And you will be bestowed the title of Dog Father. Being a Dog Father has various benefits, but really it's about showing us, you know, that that you really, really love us. And we try to then show you that we really, really love you. And mm -hmm. so sometimes the Dog Fathers are privy to early information. Sometimes they might even get some early access to a couple of things but we you know really it's it's about it's about sharing the love
All right, everybody, we have a special interview today. Uh, some great partners, uh, some great pioneers in the world of physical collecting, limited run games, one Joshua Fairhurst and one Douglas Bogart. Josh and Doug from LRG. It's, it's exciting to have you on this podcast. We can't see each other. We are all in different locations. Uh, you know, I'm in Dallas, Texas. Uh, you guys are in Apex, North Carolina. I know you guys had uh, a history in game development. We'll, we'll start with Josh on this. Josh, let me ask you, how did you get started as a developer in this crazy world? What, what was Mighty Rabbit? So Mighty Rabbit was my game development studio that I started in 2010, right as I was getting out of college. And I, you know, didn't really want to join a AAA studio. I always kind of had this uh, this dream of running my own game company. Uh, you know, looking back, probably not the smartest idea, but it worked out. Um, <clears throat> we ran basically with no money for five years. And towards the end of it, when we were running out of work and we had nothing to do, we kind of took a, a, a random Hail Mary at saving the company by starting limited run games and preserving one of the games that we had made in the process, which was an important thing to me because we had spent, you know, five years building these games. And if we just kind of went out of business and went under, eventually that game or those games that we had made would get lost. So it was important for me to preserve them physically as kind of like a, a last hurrah for the company. It just so happened that that ended up being a financial success and it saved us in the process. So you know, we started in game dev in 2010 and then switched to publishing in 2015. And now I'd say that all of my skills to actually make games have probably atrophied and I probably have no ability to do it anymore. But <laughs> no, uh, they've you know, evolved. They have evolved. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what happens when you tend to fall into like a business role. Uh, eventually you stop being able to do the things that are actually fun. <laughs> I remember an actual conversation with Larry Harvey, who, uh, you know, uh, rest in peace, Larry. Uh, he was the founder of Burning Man. And he made a comment, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, to the, the effect of when you go into the business of being an artist, when an artist goes into the business of being an artist, at that moment, you can probably only be 50% of the artist that you once were, because you have to spend the other 50% of the time being a business person. And then I think, you know, it's a weird thing, probably a, a question back to both of you. Have you seen that the business side of what you do passion, out of passion and love, but have you seen the business side of it jade you and uh, affect you in the way that you appreciate the things that you normally collect that you don't make? You know, maybe that's a Doug question. We can kick it to you, Mr. Wall of Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely changes in my attitude now from when, from before I, uh, I see the important aspects of collecting more and I, uh, I judge things a little more harshly and I, I don't know. Sometimes it's, I, I can't tell if I'm collecting because it's like a need or if I'm collecting because I actually want to, uh, a lot of times hmm. I buy things that I nor I actually want, um, but there are I find myself at times buying things that I'm like I'm never gonna play this. Why the heck did I buy it? Just because it's like an impulse, and mm -hmm. I uh, I just try to balance that out by making sure the things I'm buying on impulse aren't things that are like costing me too much money. Because again, if it's something that I'm like oh I just want to collect it because I want a full set of something, um, I don't I want to make sure I'm not spending too much money on it. Um, and I will say like. Do, being more and more involved in the game industry and like doing the publishing side, you I start judging games in a whole different light than I used to. I used to be able to just play a game and enjoy it, and now when I play a game, I play a game and I go, oh, I wonder what kind of audience this would find, and I like start thinking about things. It was the same thing like when I first started being a tester. I had these weird impulses to try to break the game. Um, I know that's something Josh struggled with too, and. Yeah, so there's all sorts of things, but I would say overall, I still love video games. I surround myself with games. I, uh, If anything, I feel more entrenched in it now, and I'm happy to be in it, and I'm happy to have the support we have and the partners we have. Yeah, I think being able to create what you guys do, what we're trying to do, we're trying to create and preserve, to keep using that word, stuff that to me harkens back to how I enjoyed a game when I got it when I was 14 or 15 or 16, all the simple things, even though the boxes I would throw away or, but that would get into that instruction booklet. We'd check it out. I'd look at every single page. I get tips and tricks. You know, we'd show things to our friend. I'd 
take the games to my friend's house. You know, if you had cartridge based games, you took you you had you had the game you took it over to your friend's house uh and played it on his machine because his mom wouldn't buy it for him or whatever you know like those those different experiences are gone now you know a lot for the most part in the way of digital download being first so anyway i just i i wondered about how your uh, appreciation of physical goods had changed by being in the business but then at the same time do you see that affecting the way you design products and even the products you sign for that basic uh, reason of trying to, you know, make people feel the way you felt <laughs> when you were younger too, and letting this jaded or the business side, you know, not, you know, how, how does that affect you in the positive in your design? I mean, are you just reticent about trying to make sure that every single thing you do is perfect, you know, because you want to give a great experience to all your customers and allow them to feel the same joy you did growing up. You know, is it that deep for you? <laughs> you know, is it, are you able to focus on that at that level, you know, still? There are a lot of products that we put out that we designed from a standpoint of wanting people to get kind of a nostalgia trip back to uh, something that they cherished in their childhood, like our bloodstained classic edition that we did. You know, we went back and hired the original Konami cover artist to do something for Bloodstain that was similar to what he used to do for all these old Konami NES games. And we put together a package that really brought back memories and feelings of being a kid and getting Castlevania or getting Contra or whatever other game for your NES. And uh, kind of did something similar with Streets of Rage 4 recently. We did a kind of oversized Genesis case that holds your steelbook and game inside. And just kind of like having this packaging that really harkens back to what you're nostalgic for. Uh, that's something that has been important to me that I think is really cool. And it's fun to design these packages that are like that, you know, know. in terms of kind of doing this impacting my appreciation of stuff. I feel like I kind of appreciate things more now. Uh, I've noticed that, like, I think a lot of people who don't work in publishing games, you know, I would say like 99.9% .9 of people don't care about know the box that things come in you kind of look at the box as like a free value add or whatever they think the box has no value and sometimes i'll get a box and i'm like man this is this must be a really expensive box <laughs> right and i just like i appreciate a box more than i ever would have previously because i can get it and i can be like wow this is a rigid box this thing you know if it wasn't <laughs> from china it's probably like 10 15 dollars you know this well you is... know what went into it you know you know how much effort it took to to do something like that at this point yeah yeah and by the way can i just say contra <laughs> yeah one of the greatest games contra <laughs> when you said that i was like yes contra yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good one uh, one of the yeah. best. So, you know, it's been a couple of years since uh, I had a chance to talk to you guys on air. And the last time we were doing this, uh, you guys were just about ready to put out uh, Saturday Morning RPG digitally at the time. And then you were just finishing up Thimbleweed, uh, Thimbleweed Park uh, with the pre-order period. And I was curious, uh, between now and then, do you view the Switch market any differently now than when you did when you first jumped in? I, as a consumer... I've definitely found myself buying things much less impulsively than I was. Um, I feel like I was at one point kind of buying every limited release almost impulsively, but I broke that habit pretty quickly. And I feel like a lot of people have kind of done that. Um, I don't think the market has necessarily shifted a, a huge amount when it comes to known titles and like things that people are really excited about like games with established fan bases like hotline miami or celeste or streets of rage like those games are going to sell but i think the market's kind of it, it's getting to a point that we saw playstation 4 get to two years ago where people are starting to care less and less about buying physical releases of games that they're not necessarily familiar with which kind yeah. of sucks for smaller devs because, uh, like, I really want those guys to be able to succeed. And previously, you know, these physical releases were a great way for them to make some extra money on this game that maybe got buried digitally. But at this point, people are being, I think, very careful about what they're buying. They, they have to watch their spending. So they're only buying games that they really know, that they really recognize. And thankfully, you know, 
we and you, you know, we, you guys have th- this huge amount of access to these great Devolver games that, you know, Devolver does a great job in kind of creating these fan bases and these communities around their titles. And that means that those games are always going to sell. You know, y- you don't have to tell somebody what uh, the messenger is. They know about it because they've seen it. They've, they've seen the fan base talk about it. Same and, with and Griff's just, and, 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 and just to games. jump in on that too, you know, sabotage as well. I mean, you're working with sabotage on a project too. And uh, you know, one of the things for me on that was to see the utter delight. I mean, like the boundless delight uh, that they had uh, as sabotage, because this was uh, of seeing a physical game of seeing their digital game come to light, you know, be accepted by the community, have great downloads. But once they saw the physical, and you just know how it is. Physical is different. That was like winning a prize for them as yeah. developers, that they actually saw their digital product come to life in a physical form. It just has a psychological effect on the developers that's it's overwhelming uh, a, a great positive feeling for them too you know yeah. so it's, it's really neat to see the developers have such a elation and you you've seen you saw that about 50 times last year <laughs> yeah. I mean, physical physical you know that's that's when the game becomes real you know a, a lot of people can take that they can show it to their family they can show it to their friends and Right. Their friends stop thinking like, oh, they just play games all day or whatever. They see that actual product and they're like, oh, man, they actually make things. They actually made something real. It's like, especially for people with developers with older parents who just don't get, you know, digital downloads or whatever. Having sure. that physical product really like legitimizes this career when you have True. older parents. Gavin, don't you already have this game? No, mom, you idiot. I have Bloodstorm and Bone Squad and Bloodstorm 2, stupid. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. We'll take a Bone Storm. Well, get two. I'm not sharing with Caitlin. That must be the happiest kid in the world. You know, what, what we're doing has a value. that The games that we're putting out have a, a perceived value. They have an MSRP, what we're selling them for, but the, the perception of value is different to every single individual, uh, whether they buy them or not. And the only way I could equate that to say, explain it to my mother or anybody else was, well, these are digital games that are coming to a physical form. You know, before there was a digital download world, we were all a physical video game world on <laughs> on floppy disks, you know, five and eight inch, <laughs> right? We were having that conversation. Doug, what what was your first like game system, you know, for you? Like what when you go back to your childhood, what was your first game system that you just was in the living room or in your bedroom and was that was yours? Um well the first one in the house was an Atari. Um, I'm trying to remember which one it was, and then but the first one that was physically mine was a Super Nintendo, and I actually got a Nintendo after that, the original NES. We found it at the apartment complex dump. Uh, it was just in the like on the side next to the big like uh, trash compactor. And you saved it. Took it home. Yeah, and the only thing wrong with it was that uh, the when you popped in the cartridge and clicked it down, it didn't stay clicked very well. So I had to use a Hot Wheel to keep it clicked in. <laughs> um, That's fantastic. Hot Wheel. <laughs> So that was the only thing wrong with it. And then I, I, I grew up with, yeah, the Super Nintendo and that for night. God, I played Super Nintendo for a long time. I didn't I didn't yeah. get any other consoles for quite a while. And then, yeah, so that's where I started. Yeah, that's, oh, man, all of those, uh, those, those older systems. What about you, uh, Josh? What, what was your first game system over there? So my family had a Atari 7800, but it caught on fire before I can actually remember ever playing it, which is weird. We, my, my, my dad was friends with somebody who was a sales rep at Atari because we grew up in the Bay Area, so Atari was kind of local. Um, and this, this friend gave him a very early production run of the 7800 because we were kind of smack dab in Atari's test market. And this thing eventually just caught on fire because my dad would play it all the time. I don't know what he did. He might have spilled something on it, but uh, we never really, I, I don't remember playing it. I just remember like occasionally I would stumble on like a manual for a 7,800 game or like a cartridge laying around in our, our you know pile of VHS tapes or whatever. Um, but the earliest console that I can actually remember is the, uh, the NES, which we tricked my mom into buying my dad for Father's Day once. Um, <laughs> Basically. Yeah, it's for him, sure. Yeah, I mean, he played the seventy eight hundred so much. We were like, yeah, he's gonna want this thing. He's gonna, he's gonna love it. But 
it turned out the NES was too complex for him versus the 7800. It was just too much to take in. So it ended up just being mine, my brother, and my sisters. And we played that thing like crazy until we got a Sega Genesis later on from our grandparents, probably like 94. I think we got a Sega Genesis, maybe 95. I don't know. It, it came with Sonic Spinball and we had Sonic 2. So we played that a lot. Um, I didn't get to play a lot of Super Nintendo because my brother owned the Super Nintendo. Um, he wouldn't let me play it at all. I almost got I almost got killed once because I started a game of Mario RPG <laughs> and realized too late that you cannot delete save files in oh. Mario RPG. You, you cannot delete your save files. So my brother very uh, was very easily able to tell that I had played a Super Nintendo. So that was uh, that was not a good experience. Uh, <laughs> the first console that I actually owned that was mine, like myself, you know, only I played it was in Sega Dreamcast. I actually sold a bunch of Beanie Babies to buy one, which kind of dates that. Uh, I, I, it's I a good decision. Very, I flipped some very rare Beanie Babies, righty and lefty, which I think are worth like maybe like thirty cents now. Hey, uh, I'll trade you some Pogs for your yes. Beanie Babies. <laughs> <laughs> so I got my Dreamcast at launch, and you know that that has kind of been my favorite system, just because it's it's the first one that I ever brought home that was mine. You know, like yeah. that. I could tell my brother, you can't play this thing. <laughs> so that, uh, that, was, that was a good, a good experience. And I love the Dreamcast because of that. But Yeah, to, the, to this yeah. day, still have to go back and say that Marvel versus Capcom 2 on that system is the definitive version. It's so close to the arcade being Naomi and the same back end. I just love it. Um, you know, you talk about that whole thing about being young and playing these games on both sides and kind of getting uh so into what that was and now that you do publishing and development you have these opportunities to work with great titles great ip great developers and we were talking about how to honor the developers right um and i don't want to single anything out but for example let's just say things like the Lucasfilm properties, Jack and Daxter, Kevin Smith, John Romero. Um, you know, I know that Smitty and I struggle on a daily basis how to honor those developers, how to honor that IP that we happen to be involved with. I would assume both of you guys, maybe we'll start with Doug on this one. I would assume both of you struggle with that yourselves. I like to live up to the name. Yeah, how to honor yeah. that? How to how to bring justice to what they're the opportunity you have on each one because it, yeah, it has to be mind numbing, you know, and and petrifyingly scared, especially with something like Star Wars. Yeah, I mean the the thing about those properties, especially for us, is that it was uh, we were huge fans, and these were legendary IPs we're dealing with, and especially like Star Wars is something like Josh and I have grown up together, uh, like seeing the a lot of the prequels together, aside from Episode One and. We uh we were really stoked and I we had like huge plans for them and the problem with those IPs though is that you're always kind of forced to work within their limits um, because they have like outside partners or they have deals that restrict you from doing things so it is a little bit stressful because you want to be able to work within those boundaries to make the best product you can that represents one of your favorite things ever um, so yeah I mean it was. It was a, a lot of challenges initially, but I think we managed to like find really good common ground to get a lot of this done. You know, Star Wars is an old franchise, and because of that, there are people who have exclusives on the most, you know, obtuse types of things. So, like if if you want to make like a Star Wars napkin, there's probably somebody who has the exclusive rights to make a Star Wars napkin. <laughs> so when we're thinking of what can we put in these collector's editions? What can we put in these things? We basically have to find out if somebody already has an exclusive on that type of item through Disney consumer products. And if they do, we probably can't do it. So it came to a point where like, basically we had to, we had to create things that honored the game, but could not exist as standalone products without the game being bundled with them. So initially we had these plans to do these really cool collector's editions that were going to have like a little metal object that represented something cool from the game, but that had to get axed because uh, Hot Wheels or Mattel had the die cast exclusive or, you know, we, we had to cut back on, you know, the, the 
folks at Lucasfilm didn't have the bandwidth to approve new art. So you basically had to work with whatever art they had, which is, believe it or not, not very much. Because I think the vast majority of the art created for these games is sitting in Skywalker Ranch and has not been digitized. So we we had access to maybe like one piece of key art for every title. And then we, we had to stretch that. We had to figure out like, how can we take this one piece of key art and create a package that works for Star Wars fans and honors the IP in the way that we want it honored. So like, it took me a while to arrive at, at a spot where I was like, this actually works. This is cool. And we landed on those. I don't know if you've seen them, but we did these, these packages for the old retro games that look like the action figure cards, but with the cartridges on them. And to me, that was kind of like my aha moment for this because you can't sell that, like the, the card back or whatever, like that needs the game to exist. So uh, we didn't run into any issues there. And it was like the perfect play to like, make this product new but exciting and honor what a lot of people are nostalgic for with regards to star wars you know most people who grew up with it they're nostalgic for the movie and and the merchandise the toys the action figures so you know we figured out kind of how to capture the nostalgia that we had and that fans have for this ip while working in side of some pretty extreme limitations i don't blame them for any of it it's like it's totally understandable and it makes sense. It's just like, how do you relay this to a customer who thinks like, like when we did our uh, Jedi outcast CEs, they were like, Oh, there's so much of the same art is being reused. It's like, man, we, we were stretched. Hmm. We, we, We were actually, we were supposed to go to Skywalker ranch and go into the archives to see what, art they had in there because we found out through another partner that there is art for these games in those archives. Disney wasn't so sure. Um, but then the pandemic hit and they closed the archives and they closed the ranch. So basically you know, we've been kind of in a holding pattern, but hopefully, you know, we, we get a chance to access those archives and maybe our future releases can be more robust. They can have more art. We can incorporate concept art or design documents, things like that. Um, those are the kind of things that I think would be really exciting to work in there. And I kind of hope that, you know, once we get that access, we're going to be able to put together packages that are more exciting but i think with the limitations that we had i'm i'm i think we did a great job (laughs) and as a star wars fan i'm very happy with what we managed to create i know that both uh smitty and i have this this great love for what came before with some of romero's stuff can you talk for just a moment on sigil uh sure that would be that would be a douglas thing like come (laughs) on but yeah, Sigil, Sigil was a fun project to do, and for me, Doom was one of the first games I ever played as a kid, because when my dad worked at a, a bunch of laboratories, like the CDC and stuff in Atlanta, like, whenever he worked the night shift and whatever he would bring me in, uh, he would just sit me down at a computer and taught me DOS on how to load up Doom, um, and pretty much every computer at the office had Doom on it, so... That was a really cool thing, and it was one of the few things, too, that I was able to do that I could tell my dad, like, hey, we're working with John Romero on, like, an unofficial Doom thing. And he was like, holy crap, that was, like, the first time he ever acknowledged my job. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he came out here, John Romero himself, to sign the sigil boxes. You know, we worked with him on how to, like, produce everything, and it was it was a cool experience. And it was something I didn't think, you know, when we started the company, we'd ever get to touch, like, a anything doom related even if it's considered you know unofficial but doom fans i think consider it canon because it's from john smitty and i talk about this kind of a lot and and you think about what's going on people are at home Uh, a lot of people wanted to buy stuff to play uh, so they went online you know they they pick up you know whatever it was that's no longer for sale which happens to be a lot of our markets Um, and and the crazy range of prices right you could you could see i don't know let's just take a dreamcast for instance dreamcast might be on the secondary market from anywhere from like a 30 dollar item to a multi hundred dollar dreamcast on there and and these crazy price ranges and and it's not just systems it's games you see that a lot in in games this big range of of prices not our games not just our games your games and games in general um physical games yeah just physical games and, and systems and all that sort of thing so you know we talk about 
the the prices and and who sets that price and who's in charge of that i i brought up the old examples if you guys remember the old magazines the price guides like wizard for comics or beckett uh you know i i'm sure you had some of yeah. those growing up it, what's your take on the secondary market for video games and how that works and 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 your thoughts just like anecdotally uh there's a there's a really good book and i'm bringing this up for the second time on this call so uh, you can just kind of assume this is what I talk about all the time, uh, <laughs> Beanie Babies. There's a really good book on Beanie Babies. And in the book, they talk about how the entire fad, the entire secondhand market and the craze was devised and developed by three soccer moms in Chicago. They just decided on a whim that they, they noticed that one of these Beanie Babies had some slight variation between another and that another Beanie Baby had disappeared from the market. So they kind of discovered that products were retiring. And because of that, they went around and hoarded, you know, all of these products that were retired and just decided, like, this one's worth this much money. And they started telling people that and people believed it. Hmm. And that's where the fad spawned out of. That's where the craze came from. And all of a sudden, you know, months later, you've got this one Beanie Baby is $5,000 because these three soccer moms decided this Beanie Baby is worth $5,000. And everyone said, okay, it's worth $5,000. I'm going to start my college fund by collecting Beanie Babies to sell down the road. It's it's my investment or whatever. So a lot of the time it is just, I think, completely arbitrary. Somebody says this is what it's worth or whatever. And I think a lot of this recent value gain has been like, it's played out in this way. So I, I, I imagine pre-pandemic, you've looked at games on Amazon and you've seen like, okay, there's a whole bunch of this one game up here for $10. But then there's this this crazy guy that's listed his game as collectible for $60 or whatever. And you're like, that's never going to sell. Right. I think what happened during this pandemic is all the $10 ones sold out. The $60 one was the only one left. Yep. And somebody said, I'm going to buy it for $60. And that set the price. And, and, you know, from there, everybody sees the sold listings. They're like, I'm going to list mine for $60. Yep. And that price that was crazy becomes the new price. And it was set by that random guy who's just like, I'm going to put this up for $60. Maybe somebody will buy it. Who cares? It's still crazy. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> well, and, and some of them. You know, yeah. I just, I was trying to buy some N64 games that I, I didn't have. And I just kind of had to sit back and say, nope, not going to do it right now because these games that used to be $30 are now $90 or $70. Like Douglas was trying to buy Daytona USA for Dreamcast. I was like, well, that should be like 30 bucks. And he's like, nah, it's 75. Oh my God. That's yeah. super common. What's up with that? So I said, no, for now. Well, like, there's everything's a difference crazy between... right now. And it's, it's, well, it's weird. Cause it's like, are prices actually going to fall or will people continue to list things for these sold prices that, you know, are established right now? I think it's possible prices will fall, but yeah. you know, it, it's anybody's guess on when. Because I do remember in 2007 or something, you know, when Crisis Core came out, Final Fantasy VII spiked to being like a hundred dollar game. You know, just a used copy of Final Fantasy VII. Right. And it's fallen. It's twenty five dollars again. But that happened like, you know, it took thirteen years for it to fall back down in countless re releases and and remakes. So. It's it's anybody's guess on you know what's going to happen with these values. I did notice you know Greece is you know almost what two hundred fifty three hundred dollars now. Yes, so. yes, and then the, even the signature edition, which I granted it has an autographed uh, four by six watercolor of Conrad from Conrad Rosé in there, you know whatever, and the book and it's a thousand twenty four dollars, and yeah. apparently some of them sold at nine hundred. But but the part that is weird, and you guys see it too, is. Uh, even with Hotline Miami, we were, we both had Hotline Miami on sale on April 21st of this year, and we both had a sellout of our units, let's just say in under an hour, <laughs> not to make it sound too, but I think you guys were sold out in like 12 minutes, but uh, so in under an hour, we sold all the units, but on minute number two, there was already a copy of Hotline Miami up on eBay for sale, even though ours were still on sale on our website yeah. as soon as we either of us sold out bang that copy went 4x you know yeah, in price and, and i was like that's, that's, that's a weird be, phenomenon right to have because yeah, it's, it's, it's they crazy don't we try to we try to do what we can to limit it because it, it, it makes our customers same. pretty yeah. angry yeah but same. you know yeah, had, with something like 
we have a game Blaster Master Zero on sale tomorrow, right? What day am I on? Yeah, Thursday. Yeah, it's, Thursday. <laughs> it's, it's already on eBay. It's not even on sale yet. Yeah, it's a it's a strange phenomenon because you know that person has to buy it from you to fulfill the sale that they've made on eBay for themselves, but there's no way for us to stop it. And then counter to that, I will say that, you know, like PayPal, uh, who's involved, you know, in a lot of transactions on both ways at, at the same time, anybody that's a customer that uses PayPal to pay also has, you know, a lot of leverage over everybody, as we all know, if they don't feel that they got a game delivered and whatnot. So, you know, I feel like those people are going to, you know, get that product eventually, but are, are they going to get it in the state that it was sold? You know, like how would the person know that bought it on the eBay that if it came in a reserve box with an art card and all that kind of stuff, or it was just a shrink rack game, you know, unless, you know, you don't have definitive proof of all that. You know, so like there's some of those things too where I don't accuse them of being a rip a ripoff, but I just feel bad for the people buying these that they may not be getting the total value, you know, of what they could have gotten if they had just purchased it from one of us or pre-ordered it from you know someone that they trust. And so yeah, I feel bad. I, I read the sob stories, you know, the sad stories about dude, I really wanted that game and I'm gonna have to pay six hundred dollars for it. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, I was like, we'll do a second chance sale. God dang it, hold on. Just don't pay six hundred dollars, please. <laughs> you know? I, I feel upset sometimes because I'll look at values for some of our old games and there will be a game that didn't sell particularly well through us and it will be extremely expensive online and be selling. And I'm like, how did we miss the audience for this game so bad that the ones who, the people who want it didn't even know we had it. Like a good example for us is outlast one and two for switch. It didn't sell mm. particularly well through us. I think we sold maybe like 6,000 or 7,000 of each game, if I remember correctly. And now this game is like 150 or two hundred dollars for the two pack on ebay and it's like how did we miss the outlast fan base so much like how did they not know that it existed for the month that we had it on sale like but maybe you built it, it, the it, hype for it you know that's maybe the thing that you're missing here is maybe by you doing the physical then it actually spiked it you know in such a way that you you incentivized this new round of interest <laughs> well, Greece, <laughs> Greece was exactly <laughs> like that Greece was exactly like that right we got in and published that physically before it's kind of like second boom right and i guarantee you there were people that came after the fact and said, wow, what an amazing pro product, what an amazing game. And I didn't even know about it until after I saw the physical land in somebody's tweet, right? They took a well, picture well, of it. Yeah. And you know what? The testament to that, too, was our second chance sale on Greece that we did where we had no games. We only had the art books. Oh, yeah. The very large, beautiful art books. And what we had like 125 or 150. And I said to you, I said, you know, those will probably be the last things to sell because there's no game related. We have my friend Pedro or whatever. And boom, the Greece art books were the first thing to sell that i think they sold out in like four minutes <laughs> you yeah. know and it was just like oh so yeah it's just what you're saying you know how did we miss how did we miss reaching out to the people who would appreciate this game whether it's a new ip or a beloved ip but sometimes i think that you might you by preserving the art in a physical form and doing what you're doing it, you might yeah i mean you're stimulating the interest for this and you know i think you're growing the market value for these uh these games in physical form of course so yeah, cool. i mean i just you know i appreciate everything with you guys and i, I just was going to ask you uh real quick is there anything coming up for y'all i mean whether it's you know personally or you know business or anything you know uh, exciting and fun and new coming down the pipe for the rest of 2020 that you, you want to tell just a few thousand million hundred people about <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start selling Beanie Babies. So oh, Beanie no. ba hey, you know what? I wanted to tell you, I was a Cabbage Patch kid, and I grew up like this. So, I, you know, I <laughs> I couldn't sell. <laughs> Remember Cabbage Patch Kids? Go look that yeah. one up, kids. If you're hearing this now and you haven't already, you should uh, go to our website and get Blaster Master Zero, uh, one and two. We've got a vinyl. We've got collector's editions. Uh, June 23rd, we're working with our buds at Special Reserve Games to do Mother Russia Bleeds. Woohoo! Um, yeah, I guess that's the most upcoming stuff that's all yeah, out there. I don't, announced. I don't think we've announced anything for the following 
for next week. Yeah. I don't even I don't even know what next week is off the top of my head. So I well, I you know what it is? It's the transition into June. Hello. I mean, How'd yeah. we get here? I mean, what is going on? And it's my birthday. Next Friday hey. is my birthday. Josh's birthday is coming up. Oh yeah. June fifth over 10th. here. When when are you? The tenth? June tenth. Oh, no, I'm God. June fourteenth. Oh man, oh, look at this. Guy. The Gemini. Oh, yeah. Gemini yeah. party. I think now I know what's going on. That's right. <laughs> it's like it's like what? Because you know, oddly enough, just look at the the three of us. I mean, Doug, you, you're in this group too, but just the three of us were obsessed. <laughs> we're obsessed my, uh, with uh, you know collecting and different things. It's um, my, there must be something in the blood. My astrology signs Aquarius, and it's like very compatible with Gemini's. See, there we go. And you can play a guitar. I can't, but I do <laughs> like guitar music. So there we go. <laughs> what a big thing to say. I like guitar music. You know, just wrapping it up. I, I always appreciate you guys for the help and the advice that you extended me personally and us when we first got started. And then I just obviously appreciate what you guys do day in and day out because I know how hard it is. I know how passionate you have to be about what you're doing to keep doing it at the level you are and, uh, you know, and growing a great customer base and a great community for all of us. So I just appreciate what you're doing. Everybody needs to check these guys out. Of course, limited run, uh, games, limited run games.com. And then all the various social medias, uh, are uh, probably listed you know, on that site. Yep. But, uh, other than that, you know, I, I look forward to sharing some good barbecue with you. Uh, I know we can fight over sauce or no sauce. And other than that, that's about probably the only thing we would disagree at, at the table. I have a feeling. So, you gotta, uh, you gotta put sauce on it. are you a no sauce guy? I am a no sauce guy. I'm a fatty brisket. I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So jalapenos and onions on the side with a block of uh, cheddar cheese is uh, good as well. So, <laughs> so I mean, I, there's some similarity. We could probably agree on the sides. How about that? We can agree on the sides. Good collard greens, you know, some good uh, cream corn with jalapenos in it. <laughs> yeah, you lost me on the sides too. Oh, uh, what are you? What, beans? I mean, I'll eat beans like mac and cheese. Uh, okay, I don't I'm writing know. all this down. I'm writing all this Hash down. Puppies. Oh, yes, yeah. the hush puppies. Absolutely. Hush puppies. Look at you guys, you fancy pants. You guys have grease to fry stuff, you know. Well, I do appreciate everything. And if uh, anyone is ever interested in getting behind, you know, great companies, uh, Limited Run is definitely one of them, man. So I appreciate you sitting in on our little podcast here. Uh, I know you guys have a cool podcast yourself, but. Um, you know, and appreciate everyone for listening and hopefully you learned something, but definitely give all the developers and, and everybody that you heard us talk about here today, give them their, you, you know, your love and support. Yeah. No, thank you so much for having us. Last time on Fire Flower from Paper to Pixels, I discussed the quiet tenure of Sekiro Yamauchi after the torch was passed from founder Fusijiro Yamauchi and the sudden pivot towards what will soon prove to be the first of many expansions beyond playing cards brought to Nintendo by its young but ambitious new leader, Hiroshi Yamauchi. While the late 1950s partnership with Disney with playing cards was certainly a key component of Nintendo's success, the entrepreneurial Yamauchi saw Nintendo's future as a more diverse landscape. Though the Daya Taxi service was ultimately sold off, its early success fueled Hiroshi to continue his further departures from the company's roots. One of these early attempts was inspired by another late 50s invention, Nissin Foods, also based in Japan, launched a new product called Chicken Ramen in 1958. The instant noodles invented by Momofuku Ando were an incredible success and inspired Hiroshi to launch a pre-portioned instant rice product under the Nintendo name. Unfortunately, the rice was not very tasty and the product failed. Unlike company leaders that came before him, Hiroshi's childhood was not quite as traditional. Hiroshi's mother, Kimi, the daughter of Sekirio and Tei Yamauchi was left to raise Hiroshi on her own when her husband abandoned the family. Hiroshi was only five years old at the time. 
Raising the family on her own was an impossible task, leading Kimi to seek the help of her parents. Hiroshi grew up under Sekirio and Tei's strict conservative guidance, shaping what eventually would be a very different leader when compared to his predecessors. Perhaps no example shows this better than any other of Hiroshi's failed business attempts than the Love Hotel. Japan's relationship with sexuality is a complicated one. From geisha houses in the 1600s to lovers' tea houses or dei chaya in the early 1900s, the practice of open solicitation wasn't exactly new. In 1958, after World War II, prostitution was made illegal, and many brothels and prostitutional establishments either shut their doors or evolved their ways of doing business. One of the more popular ways to evolve was to become a love hotel, though the name had not quite yet been coined. In the late 1960s, competition between love hotels grew fierce, with bigger, more lavish establishments attempting to one-up each other as they were built. Some were decorated in wild exotic themes such as castles, jungles, and even space. There is very little information published on what Nintendo's love hotel was like, but since Mario, Peach, and Bowser had yet to be invented, it's probably safe to say that plumbing and sewer pipes were not one of the themes. Along the way, Nintendo's various ventures were not always quite as salacious as love hotels or even their various series of pinup girl playing cards. If you've ever dreamed of having a 6-inch wide remote-controlled vacuum cleaner, they had you covered. The Nintendo Chiratori was a battery-powered vacuum cleaner released in 1979. It turns out that the Chiratori sucked more than it sucked. The device was a bit more of a novelty toy than a real vacuum. What wasn't a novelty was the Nintendo Copilus, a line of copy machines produced by Nintendo throughout the 1970s. Five different variations of the Copilus were made, including the Photocopilus, a photocopier that was banned by the Japanese government after it was found to contain hazardous materials. The Copilus line of copiers were smaller and less expensive than the traditional copiers of the time, making them quite popular. It was rumored, however, that Hiroshi knew that the Coppolas were prone to frequent breakage, requiring a Nintendo engineer for repairs, and that this planned obsolescence was a money-making scheme for the company. Nintendo even released the Mama Berica, a foldable, lightweight, and low-cost child stroller. Nintendo no Unbei Game! Jungle Game! Las Vegas Game! Disneyland Game, yeah? As a sign of expansion, Hiroshi put Nintendo through two key changes. In 1962, the company went public and was listed on the second section of the Osaka Securities Exchange and on the Kyoto Stock Exchange. Following that, in 1963, the company was renamed to Nintendo Company Limited, the name it would carry through present time. Arguably, the company's most important development occurred in 1964 with the creation of Nintendo's toy division. That same year, the very first toy, the Rabbit Coaster, was released. The Rabbit Coaster was simply a plastic mold with a track on a tilt, six individual lanes, and a few simple curves, along with a handful of plastic pill or jelly bean shaped pieces that served as the rabbits running down the coaster. The player would set each of the rabbits in place at the start of the track, then lift the gate, and all of the rabbits would slide down the track, with the winning rabbit landing in the narrow slot at the end of the track. Over a half dozen versions of the rabbit coaster were released, each unique, including one variation that could be built out of N and B blocks, but more on that later. Throughout this time, Nintendo continued to produce Hanafuda and playing cards, the very staple of their humble beginnings. No longer hand-produced, large machines were required to manufacture the cards, and engineers were required to keep them maintained. One of these engineers, a 25-year-old electronics graduate from Doshisha University by the name of Gunpei Yokoi, was working in a factory during a visit from Hiroshi. As Hiroshi was visiting Gunpei's work area, 
he noticed a strange-looking set of extending arms with tong attachments at one end and handles at the other. Although Gunpei feared he would be fired for playing with the contraption while at work, surprisingly, Hiroshi was amused by it and asked for Gunpei's permission to develop a new toy based on it. Later that year, the Ultra Hand was released, selling over 1.2 million units, and Gunpei was to continue to play a pivotal role in the years that followed. Not really sure how deep this next episode of Fire Flower is going to be, but uh, you know, the further we get into this and the closer we get to real time, the more there is, the more depth there is into what Nintendo does. So I'm really interested in seeing what I'm able to share next time. Big thanks to our guests, Josh and Doug from Limited Run. Always love talking to them. They're great people. Outside of that, though, I think, guys, we're... We're out of coins, and so this is a game over. over.